Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the best NCLEX review in the entire universe, in my opinion. You can go to Clinic Reviews to sign up for the online on demand. There's a discount, I think, going on right now. There's a discount code that if you listen to the video at the beginning, I think you can hear a discount code uh, for that. And you can also go if you want to pay to get some next gen small group tutoring with me, or if you want to pay to have have some small group tutoring with Mark. Mark's uh, tutoring is really phenomenal, really complements uh, all the other things that we do. Thank you to all of our channel members. If you decide to join our channel, you'll get to have access to one live stream a month in addition to a few other very small things. So that is, it's only $4.99 for channel membership. So that is all. Let's not bury the lead here. Let's go ahead and do pediatric asthma. So pediatric asthma isn't that much different from adult asthma, but you're not going to get a lot of pediatric or adult asthma questions because asthma, most people tend to grow out of asthma. And um, in adults, we tend to call it more of a reactive airway. So they can bronchoconstrict uh, to certain triggers, but often we don't call it asthma. We call it more of a reactive airway. So let's go ahead and get started. So for kids' respiratory rate, I had some trouble finding consistency for respiratory rates. This is from the CDC, and I actually combined um, some of them because um, some of them were just, there were just too many. So at one month, one month to six months, you can have very fast respiratory rates. So if you have a respiratory rate in a newborn, 45 to 50 breaths per minute, don't freak out about that. By, by the time they're about six months, you're looking at the respiratory rates more in the high 20s and in the 30s. And then when they're a toddler, 22 to 30 is good, four to six years, which is preschooler, 20 to 24. Um, and then school age, 16 to 22. And then by the time they're in high school, secondary school um, is closer to what adults would be. And then adults, of course, is 12 to 20. So uh, that's something you can kind of be familiar with. You shouldn't be quizzed really tightly on these. What you need to know is that a newborn, really key thing is a newborn is going to have a really rapid respiratory rate. Um, and then toddlers going to be faster than ours, but not so much faster than ours that it looks kind of freaky. Okay. So those are respiratory rates that you should know for NCLEX. Now, let's talk about asthma because with asthma, there's expected and there's unexpected. And in one of the prioritization videos that I've done, I talked about how do you choose which symptoms you're most concerned about? And you're always most concerned about the unexpected symptoms. So you have to say, well, which ones are most concerning? Because someone may come in uh, and have some wheezing and you say, okay, well, that's not particularly concerning because wheezing is expected with asthma. Okay. So with asthma, it's bronchoconstriction. That's what it is. Bronchoconstriction. And we, there's predictable triggers. So we teach people to avoid the triggers, right? And a lot of those things are, sometimes they're just triggers. Sometimes they're allergies, but it, it you know, it just depends, but we tell people to avoid triggers. So that's expected. Now, if they're loud wheezing, loud wheezing, um, means that they have some bronchoconstriction, but it's it's not so bad that they have no lung sounds, right? So you can see on the other side, on the unexpected side, you can see it says absent lung sounds or faint wheezing. Absent lung sounds or faint wheezing means they're really constricted. There's very little airflow. So you like, you'd rather have loud wheezing than absent breath sounds or faint wheezing. And then a productive cough means the airway's open, y'all. If, the, if they're being able to produce up some secretions, that means the airway's open. They're not so constricted. But if they have a dry, barking, hacking cough, um, in addition to absent or, or decreased lung sounds and a rapid respiratory rate, you're like, they're really tight. Okay. So a cough, if it's productive is better than if it's non-productive. And then you don't expect their saturation to drop. They could be having an asthma attack, but their saturation should still be over 92%. Um, and it should still be at 80% or over for peak flow so ex of expected lung function. So that's what we talk peak flow meter, right? The peak flow meter is where they, they blow into it and they see how much they can exhale, right? And that tells you they should be between 80 to 100% of peak or ideal or, or baseline. Um, and that tells you, hey, they may need an inhaler. It may, they may not be... Um, you know, perfect, but they're, they're managing it pretty well. Whereas if they drop below 80, that's where you're like, okay, we need to give them a, a, a rescue inhaler. If it's really low, if it's less than 50%, we're going to have to take them to the ED and get some more aggressive treatments. 
So anything less than 80% function is unexpected under ventilation. So if they're under ventilating, right, they just don't have any lung sounds. Tachypnea, if they're extremely rapid respiratory rate. So if they're having just typical asthma, their respiratory rate really doesn't go up that much. They may have a productive cough. They may have some loud wheezing, uh, but their respiratory rate may not go but much over, you know, 24, 25. Uh, and then, of course, if they're unable to talk and they have intercostal retractions, those are all unexpected things. So that's how you kind of decide, is this, a, is this a problem or is this not a problem, right? If someone's admitted to the hospital with asthma and they have loud wheezing, we go, well, that's expected. But if they come in and they can't talk, they have intercostal retractions and absent lung sounds, I'm like, that's a big problem. All right, so you have to understand what's expected with asthma and what's unexpected with asthma. Now, treatment, I'm not going to go into all the possible treatments, okay? If you want to go and study all that stuff, you can. But I, I just want to talk about what you're more likely to see on boards as fundamental information. And so rescue inhalers are always short-acting bronchodilators, and it may say beta-2 agonists. So beta-2 agonist and bronchodilator sort of the same thing, right? But they're short acting and long acting. And I want you to notice they both end in terol, albuterol, salmeterol, formiterol. They, and you know they're beta-2 agonists because they end in terol. So any drug that ends in inhaler that ends in terol, you go, well, that's a, a beta-2 agonist. That's a bronchodilator. Then they're short acting and long acting. The only ones that are, the only one that's short acting is albuterol. So that's the only one you have to remember. All the other terols, are bronchodilators, but they're long acting. And we don't use long acting for rescue. We may use it on a daily basis for management, but we don't use it as a rescue inhaler. And then inhaled corticosteroids, anything that's in sone, like fluticasone, these are inhaled corticosteroids. So um, steroids are and in sone, right? So these are inhaled, the inhaled type. So um, short acting, it's the rescue inhaler is albuterol. Beta-2 agonist, short-acting beta-2 agonist, bronchodilator. And then we have the long-acting beta-2 agonist. Can, this can be used as every day, take it every day, but it's not, it's to maintain, right? But not to do a rescue. And then inhaled corticosteroids often are also um, daily. So it's not uncommon to combine, say, a formiterol and a fluticasone, and you get take both maybe once a day, maybe twice a day, depending on, on how they prescribe it. I'm not exactly sure how it's prescribed, but it's not a rescue inhaler. <clears throat> now, as far as inhalers, just so you know, um, inhalers, you always have to rinse your mouth out after, after you um, use the inhaler. So don't be swallowing all that stuff in your mouth. Okay. So if you, and then you hold, and then you're not swallowing that stuff. Okay. You're rinsing it out. Okay. So take a sip and, and rinse it out uh, because you don't want any of that stuff to get, you're not trying to take it systemically. You just want it to get into your lungs. And if you should hold your breath for at least 10 seconds after an inhalation. And then if you have to take more than one puff, you should wait about a minute between puffs uh, because I don't know if this is why, this is my opinion. The first puff, you may get not as much med, especially if you're constricted, right? So not as much of it goes in. The second puff, you wait a minute, let that work. The second puff is gonna go in a lot deeper, okay? And you may find after that second, puff, you start coughing and it's productive. That's what it's supposed to do. Y'all remember I told you productive coughing is good. Non-productive coughing is bad. Now I want to talk just general principles, general principles. If you're going to test conceptually, and that is how you should be testing on the NCLEX, you should always be saying what in general are the appropriate treatments for a respiratory problem. Y'all, there's only so many options for respiratory treatments, steroids. So I, what I, if you can remember SPO2 or SAO2, right? Um, this is uh, oxygen saturation or partial pressure of oxygen, SP, and then think SPAO2 for either one of them. Okay. So if you remember that and you think, well, the S stands for steroids, the P stands for positioning, purslet breathing, percussion, or postural drainage. The A stands for albuterol. And, and I'm saying bronchodilators here. I'm saying albuterol instead of bronchodilators just because it fits the, the little A there. And then antibiotics. And then the O is oxygen. There's not much else you can do for respiratory problems, y'all, other than place them on the ventilator. If you want to intubate them, and I don't have that on here because that's not first line at all. So somebody comes in with a respiratory problem, whether it's COPD, asthma, uh, um, pneumonia, 
uh, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, uh, respiratory failure, uh, respiratory insufficiency, whatever it is, there's not much you can do other than this. This is about it. Okay. Let's stand up on the ventilator. So, um, if you can remember that these are the primary treatments, then it's just going to help you as you look, as you look to see what should I do for this problem? There's not, now these are treatments, not diagnostic test. I mean, you can get a chest x-ray, but that's not a treatment. Uh, you can get MRI. That's not a treatment. Um, you can get an ABG. That's not a treatment. These are all, those are diagnostic tests. I'm talking treatments here for respiratory problems. There's only so much you can do. There's only so much you can do. <clears throat> all right, let's do some questions. An 11 year old is admitted for treatment of an asthma attack. All right. We're talking treatments, which findings would indicate immediate intervention is needed. Select all that apply. Thin copious mucus secretions, productive cough, intercostal retractions, respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute, peak flow of 85% of personal best, difficulty talking. All right. So an 11 year old. So an 11 year old. So the respiratory rate looks okay for me, as far as I'm concerned, for an 11 year old admitted for treatment. So we're looking for treatments. Which findings would indicate immediate intervention is needed? So which are, uh, and asthma attack. I missed an A there. Um, so which findings would be expected for asthma versus unexpected? So are thin copious mucus secretions expected? Well, yeah, I told you a productive cough is okay. So if they have a productive cough, that doesn't mean they need immediate treatment because their, their airways open if they have a productive cough. Oh, well then a productive cough to me, A and B go together. Okay. Those are, those are essentially the same thing. And neither one of them indicate that it's a serious problem. Intercostal retractions. Well, that's unexpected. I don't expect that uh, on everyday asthma. Respiratory rate 20. That's fine. That, that rate is fine. Peak flow. Well, I want it to be over 80%. So that's fine. 85%. Difficulty talking. Well, that's not expected y'all. The only ones that are not expected are C and F. So those are the ones that require immediate attention. These kinds of questions, you should expect a handful, and that means five, a handful or more questions that look like this, which findings require immediate attention, especially on the case studies, the, um, the NGN case studies. Probably the first or second question you're gonna get on the NGN question is which of these findings require immediate attention or require you to report to the physician? And you go, well, the unexpected findings are the things that I'm gonna report. And you have to get in the, into the habit of saying, well, what's expected and unexpected, right? And you have to be able to, to differentiate between those two things. All right, next question. The nurse is assessing a child with asthma. Okay, we know they have asthma already. Which of the following findings should the nurse report immediately to the provider? So we know they already have asthma, a dry hacking cough. All right, well, I don't like it. Maybe pulses paradoxus. Okay, well, that's not good. That's a drop in, that's a drop in pressure, blood pressure with inhalation. That's kind of unusual that they would have assessed that, but okay. Breath sounds that are clear. Well, that's fine. Respiratory rate of 25. That's, you don't tell us how old the child is, but 24 is pretty generally okay for just about every age group. It's a little high for adults, but generally it's okay. Uh, so I'm crossing off C and D. So am I more concerned about a dry hacking cough or pulses paradoxus? Well, if the blood pressure drops with inhalation, Blood pressure, that's, the, so blood pressure is affected. If you go back and watch per, pressure and perfusion video, pr, blood pressure is affected by stroke volume, heart rate, or vascular resistance. So I would think that if you, if the pressure drops with inhalation, that's probably a stroke volume problem. So that's a, that's a problem. I'm not happy about that. So I can rule out, I'm going to rule out C and D. B is more serious than A. Even if I didn't know what pulses paradoxus was, y'all, I would still pick it because that's, I'd be like, well, I definitely don't expect pulses paradoxus with asthma. Like, even if I wasn't sure, I would know it had something to do with pressure and perfusion. I go, well, that's not, that's not good. It's okay. When you're guessing, y'all, you are going to guess on the NCLEX. You have to expect it. When you get a question, you're like, I don't know what the answer is. You say, that's okay. I knew I was going to be guessing on the NCLEX. So uh, I'm going to use strategies that I know, which is like ruling out wrong answers. I can rule out the wrong answers. And then I can compare the two and say, which one, like in this case, which one is worse? Um, and I'm going to pick the worst one. 
All right, question number three. The nurse assesses a toddler in the ED. Which assessment findings should lead the nurse to suspect that the toddler is experiencing respiratory distress? To select all that apply. Coughing, respiratory rate of 35, heart rate of 95, restlessness, malaise, or diaphoresis. All right, so I haven't done it yet, but generally I read the question, read the answers, read the question. Again, the nurse assesses a toddler. Okay, so the age in the question matters more than the age in the answer. So it's a toddler in the ED, which assessment findings should the nurse could lead the nurse to suspect the toddler's experiencing respiratory distress. So a couple things here. Toddler is important because a toddler cannot tell me how they're feeling. So that's one thing because I'm looking for assessment findings that lead me to suspect they're having respiratory distress. So they can't tell me they're having respiratory distress. So I'm looking for objective findings for a toddler. And two, they don't tell me the patient has a diagnosis of any problem. So I'm not looking for specific problems. So when, I, when I'm looking for unexpected findings, I'm actually looking for unexpected findings compared to a healthy toddler. So I'm not saying, well, is this expected for asthma or, or is this expected for um, pneumonia, right? I'm not saying that. I'm saying compared to a healthy toddler, is this expected? So is coughing expected in a healthy toddler? And don't go, well, it could be in general, is coughing expected for a healthy toddler? No. All right. Then is it generally a sign or symptom of respiratory distress? Yes, it is. If you don't know that, you should know that. Okay. Respiratory rate of 35. Is that expected in a healthy toddler? No, that's too high. By the time they get to toddlers, we've lowered respiratory rate quite a bit. We're down to in the twenties. So no. So is, is it generally a sign of respiratory distress? Yes, it is. Increased respiratory rate. Heart rate of 95, is that expected in a healthy toddler? Yes. Well, then I'm not going to pick it at all, right? Because I'm looking for unexpected findings. All right, so I'm crossing off C. Is restlessness expected in a healthy toddler? And don't say, well, it could be. No, it couldn't be, y'all. Restlessness is a clinical term that indicates uh, the it's a change, early change in level of consciousness, restlessness is. So don't say, well, it could be for a toddler if they're bored. No, 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 no. Don't be going there. Don't be saying, well, could be, maybe, if... Okay, if you say could, maybe if, you're about ready to get the question wrong. So no, restlessness is not expected in a healthy toddler. Is it generally a sign of respiratory distress? Yes, it is. It's an early sign of change in level of consciousness. And if they have respiratory distress, that could be causing that change in level of consciousness. So yes. Is malaise expected in a healthy toddler? No. Well, is it a sign, generally, is it a sign of respiratory distress? No, it's not. And it's a subjective finding. So I cannot objectively assess malaise. Malaise is muscle aches and pains. So you could say, well, they're just kind of down. They're not feeling good. They're kind of lethargic. Well, all that's true, but that we don't call lethargy malaise. We call lethargy lethargy. Malaise is more than just lethargic. Okay. Malaise is muscle aches and pains. I'm like, oh, just not feeling good. So you really can't assess malaise in a toddler. Not really. So I'm not picking that. It's not, a, it's not generally a sign of respiratory distress anyway. Diaphoresis. Is diaphoresis generally uh, normal in a healthy toddler? No. And don't say, well, it could be if they were just running. Okay. It could be if they were just running. But again, you just said could and if. So you don't say that. You say, is it a symptom? Is it a, a is it expected in a healthy toddler? No. So is it generally a sign of respiratory distress? In kids, it definitely is. Um so yes, very much so. You should, and if you don't know that diaphoresis is a sign of respiratory distress in kids, you should know that. I also talked about that in the congenital heart defect lecture, which haven't done, hasn't had a lot of people watch it. Y'all, it's really good. I mean, it's really good. So I'm just saying, it's up to you if you want to watch it. All right. So I'm going to pick coughing, respiratory rate of 35, restlessness, and diaphoresis, because those are unexpected in a healthy toddler. And they're all signs of respiratory generally signs of respiratory distress. For a child who uses an inhaled bronchodilator only when needed for asthma, doesn't say short acting, but okay, fine. Bronchodilator only when needed for asthma has a peak, res peak expiratory flow rate of 270. The child's current peak flow reading is 180. How does the nurse interpret this reading? The child's asthma is under good control. The child needs to use a short acting inhaled beta-2 agonist which is albuterol. This is a medical emergency requiring a trip to the emergency department. The child needs to use inhaled chromalin sodium. 
A child who uses an inhaled bronchodilator only when needed for asthma, so that's their typical routine, has a peak, best peak expiratory flow rate of 270, but today it's 180. So you have to figure out what that percentage is, y'all. So you have to say 180 divided by 270. And that's 66 percent. So you got to be able to do the math. You're doing you're using your little calculator app. You can have a, you have a calculator app in the NCLEX. You got to use it. Got to do a little math. Math. You're not going to get you may not get any math questions, but you got to be able to do math as part of being a nurse. So that's 66 percent of expected. So I expect it to be 80 percent or higher. So it's below that, but it's not less than 50 percent, less than 50 percent. I'm taking them to the ED but it's between 50 and 80. So I'm going to use that short acting inhaled beta two agonist. That's the point of having a peak flow meter. So it's called the yellow zone. 50 to 80% is called the yellow zone. Under 50 is called the red zone. Uh, that's when we have to take more aggressive action. All right. A five-year-old child with a known history of asthma. Okay, so we know they have asthma versus two questions ago. We didn't know that presents to the clinic with wheezing and a persistent cough. What is the most appropriate initial action for the nurse to take? All right. So we know they have asthma and wheezing is expected, but a persist and a persistent cough, depending if it doesn't say it's productive. So I'm not sure about that, but these are some of the expected symptoms of asthma. So what should I do? Initiate chest compressions. Yeah, no. Administer high flow oxygen. I hope you're not going to pick that one. So I'm cross. I haven't even reread the question again. And I'm crossing off A and B. Assess the child's peak expiratory flow rate or start the child on IV fluids. All right. Well, none of the other answers are any good. So obviously, I'm going to assess the child's peak flow rate because now, if it said give albuterol versus assess the child peak, let's just say D instead of saying intravenous fluids. Let's say D said give albuterol. And C said a child assess the child's peak expiratory flow rate. What the, the question says, what is the most appropriate initial action? So it's first. This is a first question. And so I would, if I could, I would still use the peak expiratory flow rate because I would I would want to know now. I'd probably be thinking to myself, I'm still probably going to give them that albuterol, but I would like to document what their peak expiratory flow is compared to normal. Um, so I'm going to do C. But here we're, we are going to assess, and, and it's not a rule that you always assess before you take action. That is not a rule. But when the assessment is appropriate, then you assess first. It is nursing process, but that doesn't mean you always assess before you take action. A seven-year-old child with a history of asthma controlled without medications is referred to the school nurse by the teacher because of persistent coughing. What should the nurse do first? So this is a similar question as the previous one. Uh, Seven-year-old child, history of asthma, controlled without medications. The last question said, um, doesn't say anything about what meds they take. Okay, just has a history of asthma. This person has a history of asthma controlled without medications, is referred to the school nurse by the teacher because of persistent coughing. What should the nurse do first? So I know coughing is a symptom of asthma, so I'm not sure what I should do first. Right off the bat, right? I'd kind of like to have more information because I don't know. Obtain the child's heart rate, maybe. Give the child PRN nebulizer treatment. Well, they're not, I mean, I don't know that much. All I know is they're coughing. Have a parent come and pick up the child. No, call a parent to obtain more information. All right, I really need more information. So the only ones that say get have more information are A and D. So B and C are taking action and I don't have enough information to take action yet. Now, remember, we do assess first when we don't have enough information to take action. So I don't have enough information to take action. So I'm not going to do B and C. So A, should it would it be better to do the child's heart rate or to call the parents? Well, it's a cough. I think it would be better to, to call the parent. That just makes more sense. If it said obtain a child's respiratory rate, now that I probably would have picked, but that's not what it says, y'all. It says heart rate. And the heart rate's not really going to tell me anything. And this is a coughing issue. So I'm going to call the parent to obtain more information because who knows, maybe they were diagnosed with something and they're taking an antibiotic and maybe I need to know that, right? I mean, who knows? So um, yeah, I got to call the parents. The nurse is teaching a group of parents about common triggers for asthma in children. So we talked about triggers. There's common triggers you need to avoid. Which of the following should be included in the teaching? So these are possible triggers that 
could be avoided. Dust mites, cold air, fresh fruit, pet dander, strong odors such as perfumes, and exercise. All right, a nurse, let me read the question. Nurse is teaching a group of parents about common triggers for asthma in children, which of the following should be included in the teaching. So I'm going to say, this is a sad question. So I'm going to turn each of these into a true false statement. I'm going to say, in general, this is true. So in general, dust mites are a trigger for asthma. That's true. In general, cold air is a trigger for asthma. That's true. In general, fresh fruit is a trigger from asthma. No. And don't say, well, it could be. What if they're allergic to fresh fruit? Okay, it could be, but you just said could. Not allowed to do that. So in general, is fresh fruit a trigger for asthma? No. In general, pet dander could be a trigger for as asthma. Yes. In general, strong odors are triggers for asthma. Yes. In general, exercise is a trigger for asthma. Yes. So I'm picking all these. Okay, all these are possible. So these are all things that until you know what could trigger, um, you got to avoid these things. So um, scarf around, uh, a scarf face covering when they go out. So if you're thinking, well, okay, these are triggers, well, what would I teach parents to do? Well, I might teach them to wear a scarf if they go out in the cold. I might teach them uh, to uh, not go over to their friend's house if they have animals. Uh, I might teach them, to um, start slowly when they exercise. We got to exercise could be a trigger unless we get you well controlled. So that may mean that you've, you've really got to take your daily uh, long acting or your daily inhaled um, steroid so that you don't have that when you go to gym class with all your friends. Um, uh, dust mites, uh, sweeping and dusting regularly in the house for the child. No carpeting. We usually say no carpeting. Uh, for kids with asthma. So those are some things you got. When you think about these are triggers, you have to say, well, what would I do about them? So that when you get the intervention questions, you, you know what to teach for interventions. A child with asthma states, I want to play some sports like my friends. What can I do? All right. We know exercise is a trigger, right? The nurse responds to the child based on the understanding of which information. Most children with asthma can participate in sports if, supposed to be if, the asthma is controlled. Right. That seems like a true statement. Children with asthma must be excluded from team sports. That does not seem like a true statement. That is that is too extreme. Must be. I don't like it. Extreme words are red flags. I'm not picking B. Vigorous physical exercise frequently precipitates an asthmatic episode. Well, that's true. Physical activities are inappropriate for children with asthma. OK, B and D essentially say the same thing. It's a single choice answer. I'm not picking either one of those. They basically say the same thing. So let's go back and reread the question. A child with asthma states, I want to play some sports like my friends. What can I do? The nurse responds to the child based on the understanding of which information. Most, so I'm only looking at A and C now. Most children with asthma can participate in sports if the asthma is controlled, or would it be more important for her to think about vigorous physical activity frequently precipitates an asthmatic episode? So in this case, I have two right answers. I have two true statements. So when I have two true statements like this, these are kind of big ideas, right? Like, like conceptual ideas. So when I get two sort of true statements like this, I say, is there one that encapsulates the other? So there, is there more of an umbrella option? One that like the other one fits into? Um, like, for example, if I say, uh, what's most important to assess? And, and the options are heart rate, respiratory rate, temp, or vital signs. Well, vital signs is the umbrella answer, right? It encapsulates all those other things. So I say, it would the fact that most children can participate in sports if the asthma is controlled, is that the bigger idea? Or is the bigger idea vis vigorous physical exercise frequently precipitates an asthmatic episode? See, I think the bigger idea is A, because although C is true, A is the big idea. Yes, Exercise precipitates it, but they can participate if it's controlled. So I think A is the bigger, bigger idea. That's the umbrella answer. So I'm picking that. Now you may say, well, I don't see where how that's the umbrella answer. Okay, that's fine if you don't see it, but um, figure out a different way to answer this question. Then you might just go, I like A better. That's okay. You, you know what Mark says? Mark Lemick says, hey, if you think an answer is right, it's probably right. Just pick it. That's what he says. Okay, so that's that's all good. All right, so that is the end of pediatric asthma. There were some bigger ideas in this video, so I hope you don't go, well, I can only use that information for kids. Well, no, there are some bigger ideas here, right? Like the respiratory treatments, those are some bigger ideas. Some ideas of when someone bronchodilates, what are some bronchoconstricts? I'm sorry, bronchoconstricts, what do you, what do you expect to see? So there, there were some bigger ideas. I hope you 
enjoyed this video. So, hey, I'll see you later. Have a great rest of your day. Mwah. Bye.